Hello, I think that I've got something that you're really going to like here. See, the market graph that we see where we see a supply and demand curve crossing, it's um, something that's not obvious that behind each of these little points are uh, decisions and individuals and, and that they're coming together as either a supplier demander and what we call a market. Now, in a basic market, all markets are where um, a particular place, a particular time, where buyers and sellers make an exchange, where someone is offering a good or service for sale and someone pays for it. And what we have is possible prices that could be charged and a corresponding amount uh, that would be demanded at that price. For instance, at $60 of this thing that's being sold, there's only one that's in demand. Hardly anyone wants to pay that price at this time in that market. Mostly that means that somebody you know, who's wanting to buy this thing, they know they can get it cheaper somewhere else. So they'll go to a different market, maybe like the difference between, say, a retail market, wholesale, online, uh, buying it in the middle of the night versus in the middle of the day, all sorts of different variations. But it is possible that there might be somebody who's willing to pay, say, $60 for this item, whatever it is that's being sold here. I wanted to uh, uh, show you, though, that as the price comes down at a particular time and place, that the number that would be in demand increases. So much so that at $5, there's 4,000 of them in demand. So you can see that the, there's very much a downward relationship or an inverse relationship of showing the law of demand between the price that might be charged and the quantity demanded of that. That's why people can choose to participate in this market or they can choose to uh, go uh, uh, purchase at another point. And so they let their prices uh, d drive them. Like, for instance, someone that might not even be interested in, in paying for it at $25 or $30 might be willing to pay for it at $5. And folks might be willing to wait or go a long way, go out of their way to get something uh, at a very low price. And you see that in many different examples. Now over here is, is the quantity supplied at hypothetical prices. And we see that the willingness of suppliers and potential suppliers to go out of their way to sell at $60 this thing in this market is very high. 10,000 units would be supplied at a hypothetical price of $60. But we see here that $60 is not really a, a, a price that this market is going to dictate. We, we realize there's a lot of people that would be willing to go out of their way to be a supplier. Uh, even folks that are not normally suppliers would be willing to do it for $60 a piece. But um, uh, there's hardly any demand for it at $60 a piece. So this is not going to be a, a combination of quantity demand and quantity supply that, that, w that would be sustainable. But as the price comes down, the quantity demanded increases and the quantity supply decreases until you get to a point where at $20, the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded are equal to each other. So we would say that at prices above that, there's downward pressure on price because there's a surplus. Too many are being supplied compared to how many are in demand and it pushes the price down. And at prices below that amount, we would see that there's an, uh, a shortage that the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied and there's upward pressure on price. Only You only have balance of forces of the supply of demand, uh, the, the law of demand, the law of supply, uh, balance each other out at this market clearing price for this particular market at uh, $20 and at 1,200 units. Market price and market quantity are, are, are both required for the equilibrium. And we see this graphically represented here. Now, part of this uh, lesson, part of this video that I'm asking you to watch is, is not only the relationship here, which you are probably familiar with, but how the, that we graph it and also how the graph um, is actually made and shaped and how that relates back to individual choices. Now, if we come on up here, you'll see uh, with, in the accompanying uh, file here that a market is any time and place where exchange takes place and that we're showing the equilibrium in this marketplace. We're also showing that when the equilibrium, um, if the prices are above the equilibrium, they're too high, a surplus is created and there's a resulting downward pressure on price. 
and at prices below the equilibrium, the prices are too low, and the shortage results in upward pressure on price. And there we go. Now, if we wanted to hone in on the supply and demand curves, you'd see that this section, this is a close-up uh, of, of these five prices and those five quantities. It's exactly like these five prices and those five quantities. And what we have here is um, yeah, those five prices and those five quantities. And what we have here is just a graphic representation of that. If we were to click on this graph, we would see that the demand curve and the supply curve are uh, just a, a, a easier to, to tell what it is. And if you scroll your arrow over any of these points, you'll see that it corresponds with the uh, supply curve, for instance, and, and a particular point. So this $15 and 400 units being supplied corresponds exactly with that square right there. So this $15,400 being supplied is that point right there. Okay. So uh, trusting that you understand what we're doing here, I wanted to show how a labor market is in fact a uh, special kind of market, but it it. The, all the same principles apply in the labor market, right? A labor market is any place and time where time and talent is exchanged for pay and benefits. So that's what a labor market it is. Of course, students get confused by the labor market sometimes because when you think about who suppliers are and demanders are normally, it's kind of reversed in the labor market where that the, the sellers in the labor market are you and I and other workers, people, you know, the households and so forth, are, are suppliers in the labor market. And the businesses that hire us, the employers, are the demanders in a labor market. And that can be confusing until you get your head around it. This market graph below also shows what we call, instead of calling it the market price, we call it the wage in the labor market, but you can put P or W, it's it's fine. But I'll, I'll often refer to it as W. And you'll see that the basic principles, everything that we said before about prices or wages above or below the equilibrium cause downward or upward pressure as as uh, it applies. So, so that if we uh, take a look at this data and now realize that we're talking about the market for labor, we can see that if labor is, you know, let, let's say uh, $60 an hour is a pretty good price to get. Who is willing to work for $60 an hour? And we might all put our hands up and say, yes, I'll be willing to work 50 hours and you're willing to work 50 hours and someone else is willing to work 100 hours and someone else says, well, I already have a full-time job, but I could, I could probably make time on a Saturday or maybe uh, I'll work overtime if it's paying $60 an hour. And they'll and there's so many people in the marketplace who are willing to work for $60 an hour, if, even if it means that it's, they're, they're, you know, they have their main job and then they also have this second job that pays $60 an hour, they're willing to do that. And, and you'll find that, that, that at $60 an hour that the, the demanders of labor, the em, uh, employers, uh, there's very few people uh, that are uh, looking to pay $60 an hour. And so $60 an hour is not a wage that most people get paid. Now we're going to talk about different types of labor markets, including ones that do in fact get paid $60 or more. But but I wanted to show you that in this particular labor market, the time is, not, is only one factor. It's also the talent. So whatever it is that they're being asked to do in this market is does not command a $60 wage. In fact, it, it, what it does is it commands a $20 wage. So we can imagine what kind of jobs that you know that pay $20 an hour. And at $20 an hour in this market that we're illustrating, it's the same graph, really. It just says hourly wage now instead of price. And the same sort of focus is on there. What we see that at $20 an hour, the number of uh, hours that are being asked of people in this market and the number of hours that are suppliers, that is workers, are willing to offer uh, is uh, in equilibrium. At prices above that, you know, let's say that if there was a if there was a price where we we had um, a need for 324 hours of work to uh, to hire somebody, but 
but so many applicants came in and so many people wanted to do it that there were, we really saw that there was a huge surplus of workers and willingness to work. So many people were willing to work at this price of $30. Given the amount of hours that we actually wanted to hire somebody at, we realized that we must be paying too much. That huge line of people willing to work is an indication that the price of $30 is unnecessarily high. We could probably lower our offering price as an employer to $25 and still find that there's so many people looking to work for us given the number of hours that we're willing to hire them at at $25 an hour that we could even lower our price lower. But if we if we lower our price, let's say, down to $15 an hour, we uh, could we, we would be eager to hire lots of people and, and pay them $15 an hour in this whatever this uh, market is for this kind of work that we're asking them to do. And yet the number of people who are willing to work in our market, our town, you know, our business, who are willing to work to do what we're asking them to do for $15 an hour, they know that they can go someplace else and make more than $15 an hour. So very few people and very this is not this is really the number of hours uh, or units of labor that are being offered so how many units of labor would be supplied to this market at $15 an hour only 400 and how many units of labor would be purchased at this at $15 an hour 1800 so what we have here is a shortage right because the quantity supplied the number of workers is less than the quantity demanded of workers and therefore that shortage drives prices up to twenty dollars an hour. This is a key idea that because that the suppliers and demanders of labor are the ones that actually determine the price of labor, and that the freedom of workers to work in other markets, uh, whether either different skills, different times of day, different towns, and the willingness of of demanders of labor to hire something other than workers, like robots, or go out uh, to a different market and so forth, creates this. Uh, a voluntary exchange for labor which uh, determines the price and how many hours people get. That's, that's how the labor market works. So if we were to see the graph, I, you'll see that I added some elements here. Notice that the demand for labor in this market is almost zero at wages above $35 an hour. So whichever labor market we're talking about here, it can't withstand prices that are very high that the that if if the wage was very high there'd be so few employers that would pay that wage that that workers would be unemployed because there wouldn't be enough demand at those higher wages also notice that the supply of labor in this market is almost zero at wages below ten dollars so the workers here know that they can get better than ten dollars hardly any of them are willing to work in this market for for ten dollars or or less and that the uh, they know they can go elsewhere and do other things but there's a happy equilibrium an agreement let's say between buyers and sellers in this case workers and employers that at twenty dollars an hour the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded if the wage rate was currently twelve dollars in this market right what would happen? How would the self-correcting market mechanism operate to automatically increase wages to the equilibrium? Well, you say, well, at $12 down here, the quantity supplied of workers is very low, the quantity demanded of workers is very high, and there's a shortage of workers because the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. That's, def that's the very definition of a shortage. So the few workers that are willing to work in that area will be poached or enticed at, to stay working for them. You, know, you can imagine if there were 40 employers in town and they were all paying, let's say, $12 an hour, but there was only a few people that were willing to work in that town at such a low rate that, that someone would, who needed an employee would say, hey, come, come work for me and I'll pay $13 an hour. And someone else would say, no, pay, I'll pay $15 an hour. Someone else will say, I need somebody so much. We can't, can't keep our doors open unless we get some help. I'll pay $16 an hour. And when the wages start rising up, then people who are working for $12 an hour will switch over to another employer 
who's paying better and giving you know better all things considered all things being equal if it's if you can say well i'm doing the same work and the and the quality of the life is about the same either place except one of them is paying me a whole lot more than the other I, I i will leave and so and then if if you let's say your worker was about to leave you and you need workers and and it's because you were only paying twelve dollars an hour you might try to say hey what how much are they paying you i'll match it or i'll i'll pay a dollar more per hour than they are and that activity of of uh, is what we call the self correcting market market mechanism that automatically prices or wages that are too low automatically move back up again as long as there's plenty of competition among suppliers and demanders and and uh, if you allow the market to operate you'll reach the equilibrium automatically people will be making more money unless right the market equilibrium is $12 but if the market equilibrium is twenty dollars, you won't keep the the wages will not stay low for very long before they're it automatically fixes. Okay, and then this is just a, a focus of uh, zooming in on the same idea, right? Twenty five dollars is too high in this market. See, the quantity demanded is six forty eight, when the quantity supplied is thirty six hundred, and a surplus of workers and applicants will drive wages down. Here at twenty five dollars an hour there's a surplus and it'll automatically drive it down to twenty dollars an hour in a matter of uh, in a, 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 just a matter of time for the market to fix itself and get to the right wage fifteen dollars an hour is too low in this market the quantity demanded is eighteen hundred when the quantity supplied is only four hundred so the shortage of workers and applicants will drive the wages up to twenty dollars an hour hopefully this is helping you to understand that that when, when we draw these graphs, we see the, the uh, equilibrium price, but we also know what would happen and we can see what would happen at prices that are not the equilibrium, and that helps us to do it. Now let's switch to a very particular kind of labor market, the labor market for heart surgeons in the United States of America. That's right, it's heart surgeons, our workers, and a labor market is any place where in this case, time and talent of the heart surgeon is exchanged for pay and benefits. So in the heart surgeon labor market, the surgeons are the sellers, they're the suppliers, the hospitals are the buyers. It's useful to remember that all labor markets are derived labor markets. So meaning that usually people are not buying the labor directly, the, the customers, it's, it's what the labor is producing. So in, for instance, there's a demand for, for heart surgeries in this um, country. And therefore, there's a demand for uh, heart surgeons. Uh, surgeons are paid by hospitals because patients demand hospital services. This market graph indicates what the other market graphs did, right? They in indicate the equilibrium point and the market clearing wage, but also indicate how much disequilibrium you would have if you're not at the equilibrium price or equilibrium wage. So when the wages are too high, a surplus is created because the quantity supply is greater than quantity demand and it results in downward pressure on wages. And when prices uh, are below the equilibrium, they're too low and a shortage results. Uh, that's how you know it's too low because the quantity supplied is less than the quantity demanded and that shortage drives, uh, puts upward pressure on, on wages. So for these are, these are current data for 2021. Um, under in the U.S. at say $400 an hour for heart surgeons, the quantity demanded would be a thousand, and the quantity supplied though of surgeons uh, would be 14. Oh, heart surgeons would be 1420. So a person who's talented enough to be a surgeon, right, has to decide what kind of surgery they're going to specialize in, and you know a person who's thinking about. Um, who's already a doctor, who's thinking about whether to be a general practitioner or to specialize in surgery, the extra amount of, 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 of effort that puts into, what we see is that at very high wages, the quantity supplied would increase. Also, existing heart surgeons have to decide how many surgeries they want to schedule per week, for instance. So if you know that you're going to be in uh, surgery for six hours um, uh, for a single surgery, how many surgeries would you like to do a day? And how many days would you like to work if you're a heart surgeon? 
So some, I have a friend who's a heart surgeon and he uh, lives in Chicago, but he does all his heart surgeries in Oklahoma City. Uh, uh, I can explain why in another video, but the, the, the uh, uh, market for heart surgeons in Oklahoma City is different uh, than the heart surger, uh, surgery, heart surgeon labor market in Chicago. And there's uh, uh, the, the wages that he pays and the costs and trouble of being a surgeon in, sh in Chicago versus Oklahoma City is enough to incentivize him to fly down to Oklahoma City uh, every week. And he does three surgeries a day for four days, and then he flies back to Chicago. So he does 12 a week. Um, you can imagine, uh, I don't know what your answer was when you were thinking about that, but uh, that's what he does. And uh, I don't know how long he's going to do that for. There's going to be some point where he's going to scale back, I'm, I'm sure, and he'll decide even at high wages that he might decide to only do maybe two a day instead of three a day, or he'll go down and only do it for three days a week instead of four days a week. And that means that the quantity supplied of heart surgeries will, will decrease because my friend, being a U.S. heart surgeon, will, will decrease this by a few because remember, when we're talking about the market for heart surgeons, we're talking about a particular time and place. And if the place is the USA, then it doesn't really matter whether it's Chicago or Oklahoma City. And, uh, but the time, not only is like nowadays, but we're talking about like per week or per month, whatever this time period is that, that there's making an exchange. There's per shift, something like that. Okay, now let's get back to the thing. Now these, are, these are new numbers that we're using here and they're revealing. What we see here is that there's some degree of change in the quantity supplied. As the price goes down, the number of, of uh, hours that heart surgeons are willing to work in the USA drops to, you know, from 1420 down to 870. So it's uh, like 550 hours of difference in the USA, uh, given a difference between a, a wage rate of 125 an hour versus 400 an hour. But the quantity demanded for heart surgeons is not changing by quite as much, right? The, at very high wages, the quantity demanded for heart surgeons is 1,000, and at very low prices, it's 1,220. So even though that, that's like half as much of a difference in, in um, the range. So if we take a look at that, that, that's what we refer to as elasticity. So the demand for heart surgeons is fairly inelastic. It has less to do with the price and more to do with whether you need a heart uh, surgery or not. And um, the quantity uh, supplied has a lot to do with, uh, has more to do with the price because that's an individual decision on the part of the surgeons and where, where they're going to work. You know, do I, would I rather play golf or would I rather uh, do a heart surgery? Um, well, if I'm getting paid $400 an hour, I'd rather do a heart surgery. And if I'm getting paid $125 an hour, I guess I'm going to play a little more golf than I would have otherwise. So, all right. And then this is just a close-up of that. Now, let's take a look at what these graphs look like. So, here is the graph that uh, I'm trying to illustrate here. This graph is directly uh, a representation of the information that we were just looking at. And that um, shows that the equilibrium point for surgeons in the USA is $250 an hour. And that it's 1,120 uh, hours uh, per time period. The, um, uh, and there's a, that's a national value, let's say it's per week. Notice that there would be a surplus of surgeons at wages above $250 an hour. So let's say at $275 an hour, the quantity supplied is more than the quantity demanded, and that would create a downward pressure on the price. That's why heart surgeons don't get paid. Uh, you know, the average price for a heart surgeon per hour in the U.S. is $250 an hour and not $300 an hour or $400 an hour because there's... The, the, the quantity supplied would be greater than the quantity demanded at, at these high prices, and it pushes the price, even for heart surgeons, down. It, it applies to all labor markets. Same thing is true here. The reason why the 
price or the wages paid to surgeons is not less than this is because at at lower prices the quantity supplied of heart surgeons would be less than the quantity demanded of heart surgeons and that shortage would push the price up to $250 an hour. That's how labor markets work. What, whatever you do, this is how it works. Works for college professors, you know, people pumping gas, uh, and everything in between. Okay. If income taxes increased for people earning more than $100 an hour, how would the self-correcting market mechanism operate to automatically increase wages and the cost of heart surgeries? I think that's an excellent question, one that I'd like you to consider. If you've watched this video this far, then I'm going to reward you with the answer. I'll give you my answer anyway. What we would expect to have happen is that um, you know a high income tax rate, like some people talk about taxing the rich. Well, certainly a person that's making $250 an hour uh, might be thought of as a rich person. Uh, it depends on how many hours they work. Right? If you only work 10 hours a year, then you're only making you know uh, two thousand five hundred dollars uh, a year, and I guess you wouldn't be considered rich. But the word rich is uh, kind of a a word that is very subjective. But if we were to tax uh, surgeons, then surgeons would realize, uh, and we do tax surgeons. But if we were to tax them extra high because of their high wages, for instance, and their high earnings, then we would um, expect that they would recognize that they would um, not be making as much money even though it's we say that we're paying them $250 an hour if they have to pay let's say 80 percent income tax then they only get to bring home 20 percent of that $250 right or 50 bucks so if you said okay do I want to perform extra surgery this you know it's let's say it's late in the year you've already made a lot of money this year you're a heart surgeon and you know that you're getting paid uh, whatever you get paid you got to give 80% of it to the government because you're now in an 80% tax bracket so how motivated are you to risk you know killing somebody risk getting sued for malpractice stay up late, miss out on golf, miss out on your family, fly down to Oklahoma City, everything else, right? So all of, all of the um, things that have to do with that, right, would you, would you find that maybe uh, $250 an hour really isn't enough because you don't get, even though you're getting paid $250 an hour, you don't get to bring home more than 50 bucks an hour for doing all that. And you've already made you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars already because it's, uh, you know, you because it's the towards the end of the year, right? If you're in the second part of the year. So you could easily see that that you're less motivated to do so. At least some surgeons would be less motivated to do so. And that's enough to recognize that there'd be a decrease in the supply of heart surgeons. So the de the decrease in the supply of heart surgeons would would um, be indicated by a leftward uh, turn in the in the supply curve. You would have a a new supply curve that would move to the to the left of the old supply curve. That tax on on surgeons would then drive the price of of uh, hourly rate for heart surgeons up to say $350 an hour because the demand for heart surgeons wouldn't wouldn't have changed at all but the supply of heart surgeons would change and you'd now have a a a, a bigger piece so if we wanted to graphically represent that there's a couple of ways we could do it and one of those ways would be to uh, put a um, another column in here that a uh, and what this is how we're, I'm going to start showing you how this is done so the this is um, uh, taxed supply so what we would have is that the quantity supplied to Right, as opposed to quantity supplied one, 
would would uh, would change, and we might find that instead of one thousand four hundred twenty hours of surgery being offered at four hundred dollars, we might find that there's a um, a decrease in say three hundred equals that minus three hundred hours. And let's just say that that just carries all the way down here uh, in there. Now, if that were to happen, then we'd see that um, there's there's a, a problem. Okay, <laughs> so there's a big problem, and and um, what we're going to do is we're going to graph this. So we're going to go into. Uh, I better back this up so you can appreciate what's going on here. Okay, so now we're going to go into here and we're going to um, select data and we're going to add another curve and we're going to call this supply 2 and for the x values we're going to select this column right here and for the y values we're going to still use the same prices as listed over there. And now what we have, okay. What we have now is the original supply curve, and now we have the new supply curve. And the, the, because some surgeons decided to back off on how many heart surgeries they did, then they, um, you know, let's say, for instance, you might say, rather than work on doing heart surgeries and getting paid and then having to give almost all of my pay to the, to the tax man, I might, use, I might use my time for leisure, but I also might use that time to develop a mechanical heart, or I might use that time to, to do some uh, charitable work, or I might use that time to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, do something else since it pays so little, I uh, uh, now that after taxes, so it would change what it would do, and that, and one of the effects of that is that you know a person who's highly specialized in serving society the best with their heart surgeries ends up doing something less uh, useful to society because their activity is getting taxed, and that's that's always the uh, dead weight loss and effect of taxation is that. It, it disincentivizes people from doing what it is. So you said more simply, you get less of anything you tax. And you'll get more of anything you subsidize. Okay, so now this new supply curve now creates a new equilibrium point. And although it's not you know, a perfect matchup, it looks like the new equilibrium price is somewhere between $350 and $375, right? Because the quantity demanded and the quantity supply at 375 is not quite in equilibrium, but at 350 it's not quite in equilibrium either. You're comparing this value to that value, this quantity supply to that quantity demanded. It's pretty close though. So what we let me ask you this: If the quantity demanded is 1040 and the quantity supplied is 1020, will there be upward or downward pressure on price? If you said upward pressure on price, you'd be correct. 350 is almost the right price, but a little bit higher, maybe 355 or something like that is the intersection point where, where the two come together. And that's how that graph works. Now, I see a similar sort of situation here. The, uh, at $275 an hour, it's too high for the market, right? for the original market. Surplus of surgeons willing to perform heart surger, surgeries is greater than the quantity demanded of heart surgeries at 275 an hour, and that would drive the price down to 250. See here, when the price was 250, 225 is too low. There'd only be 1140. Well, I'm sorry. There's 1140 being demanded at 225 an hour, but the quantity supplied is less, only 1070. Some heart surgeons on the margin will decide to work a little less, and the shortage will drive wages up to 250 an hour. That's what we mean, the self-correcting market mechanism. Beautiful. All right, now let's look at one more example. This is the la labor market graph for heart surgeons in Fairbanks, Alaska. In Fairbanks, Alaska, 
it's even though they're heart surgeons, right? You'd think it would be, um, you know, the same maybe, but it's quite different, right? It's a different characteristic. In the heart surgeon labor market, the surgeons are the sellers and the hospitals are the buyers. Nothing's changed about that. And it's still a market where you're exchanging time and talent for paying benefits. But the market for heart surgeons in Fairbanks, Alaska is anomalous because the supply of heart surgeons is below normal. Heart surgeons have a wide array of choices where they live and work and relatively few choose to li live in the land of the midnight sun. So surgeons who live outside of Alaska are willing to fly into Fairbanks to perform surgery, but they'll only become suppliers at high wages. The surgeons that are in Fairbanks, right, they don't need to be paid quite as much, right? They've chosen to live there. They like it. They're, they're, they're all right there. But, but there's the demand for heart surgeons surgery in Fairbanks is pretty extensive. People from all over Alaska are going to go get their surgery. Either they're going to have to fly out of the state to get s surgeries done. Maybe they'll fly to Oklahoma City. But uh, if they're going to stay, and you know, if you're if you need a heart surgery, possibly flying is a bad idea for you. Very life threatening. So you might go to Anchorage or Fairbanks. Uh, Juno is very small. Very very few uh, heart surgeons there. Many people that are are um, uh, due for a heart surgery in other parts of Alaska have to travel to one of the population centers because that's where the facilities are and that's where the surgeons are. But the surgeons get paid um, based upon supply and demand. And the way it works in Fairbanks, Alaska is that, let's say, at, at $530 an hour, there's 75 surgeries demanded at higher wages, slightly less, at lower wages, slightly more, but basically every week there's a, you know, about 75 people that want heart surgeries in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, and the number of uh, heart surgeons that are able to perform heart surgeries in Fairbanks is insufficient to meet that. So. Like, for instance, uh, there's only one person who will do, say, four surgeries a week at, if, if, the, if they're getting paid $230 an hour. Or, uh, right. So, and if they're, if they're, but at higher and higher wages, the number of surgeries that are required are still about the same. But the number of surgeons that are willing to work increase get larger and larger now what we want to do here is get the uh, graph to reflect the right price you'll notice that this is still the graph that I was using from the prior sheet so we're going to go to this graph we're going to uh, select data and over here for the demand data we're going to edit that instead of drawing from the heart surgeons USA piece we're going to draw the demand curve from the Alaska surgeon. So I click on the tab down here, and I click that, Alaska surgeon. Very good. Then I'll click this, and I'll say, instead of doing Heart Surgeons USA, I want Alaska surgeons, and that's going to be the supply curve here. Uh, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's good. So this the series, the Y value is the price or wage and the x value is the quantity and that's how I fit, do the demand curve and that's good. You see that now my my graph is reflecting the new demand curve which is consistent with what I've shown you in a very inelastic demand curve. Right? The demand curve is almost straight up and down because it reflects that the demand for heart surgeries have very little to do with the price as reflected in the numbers and also reflected in that blue graph that we're indicating here. But now we'll take a look at the supply curve. We're going to edit that as well. And here we're going to switch that from the uh, Heart Surgeons USA tab over to the Alaska Surgery tab. Very good. And we're going to change the quanti the uh, from, from this one over to that one. And then we're happy with that. And what we see, good, we're done. What we see here is that we have an elastic supply of heart surgery and an inelastic demand for heart surgery services. And so the quantity uh, and 
uh, that is the supply and demand meet to determine the equilibrium price and quantity, which is $530 per hour in Fairbanks, Alaska. And we come over here and we can, we can um, change that to 530 and change that to 530. And we might think about another question, right? So um, instead of asking that same question, we, we could uh, ask it and we'd see that it would, if we tax the rich or if we tax high earners, then the cost of uh, uh, performing uh, health care in Fairbanks, Alaska will rise if that happens and fewer people will get heart surgeons you know hearts fewer heart surgeries will be performed as well it'll be hard to justify that it'll it'll be um, it'll be expensive so but instead of asking that question what we might do is consider something else let's let's think about um, uh, suppose it uh, becomes legal for um, immigrant surgeons without uh, AMA, American Medical Association uh, um, suppose it becomes legal for immigrant surgeons who don't have uh, who are not members of the AMA to uh, perform surgeries in Alaska. So we'll just let states decide whether they want to uh, uh, enforce American Medical Association um, rules. The American Medical Association is a private interest. There, there, there are. They're a special interest group that um, tries to protect their wages uh, by prohibiting uh, people from becoming doctors. So then they're, because they're made up of doctors they, that want to charge high prices, they prevent people from becoming doctors. And, um, and then the government enforces their rules. So it would be like if you and I formed a club and, and then got the government to put anyone in jail who wasn't a member of our club, who tried to, to do what, what we said only our club could do. Well, that's what the AMA does. So, so if it became legal for immigrant surgeons without AMA certification to perform surgeries in Alaska, then that would mean that now a person who was a doctor, let's say in India, and was a perfectly fine heart surgeon in India, uh, could then come to Alaska, or let's say a Japanese heart surgeon could come to Alaska, and and uh, or a Russian uh, heart surgeon could come to Alaska and perform surgeries, and the wages that they are paid in those other labor markets for heart surgeries are much less than 530. So all of a sudden, what that would do is it would shift the supply curve to. Uh, be um, uh, quite uh, quite a different value than what we have here. Well, let's let's see what would happen. So then, um, uh, no AMA uh, required in Alaska. If that was the case, and here I got a. Um, If that was the case, then now we have a quantity um, supply uh, uh, two, right? So this was, you know, this is, or we could say this is quantity, another way that it's sometimes done is quantity supplied hash mark, and then this one would be quantity supplied double hash mark. Now, what would happen there? What, what, what do you think? Would that, uh, the reason why we're saying it's a supply issue is because this is a regulation, 
and regulations affect supply. It doesn't affect demand. So, so the quantity supply, you know, the people need heart surgery whether or not they're 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 being operated on by an AMA uh, person. They 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 either need the heart surgery or they don't. So this is uh, unrelated. But the supply is quite different. What we might find is that in Alaska, the number of people who are then able to perform surgeries, right, and are willing to perform surgeries and willing to go to Alaska to do so increases. So this might be, say, an increase. We'll take this number and, and we'll add um, uh, maybe may, maybe 30 to it, something like that. There might be extra extra people to do so. And now, that there's extra, you know, there's per week, the number of people willing to do that. And what we'll see because of that increase is we ought to graph that now. And we'll go ahead and select some data and we're gonna add another one and we're gonna call that uh, um, no AMA supply. And then to select that value, we're going to use this as the x values. And then for the y values, we're going to choose these wages right here. OK. Now we see that this gray line is the new one. And that what that does is it means a couple more people get surgeries because of it. And the price of doing those surgeries comes down. So instead of worker instead of heart surgeons getting paid 550 an hour they now are getting paid something like 450 an hour something like that so we can see that the quantity demanded and supplied probably work out to about 70 you know it's it's either going to be 76 or 77 and that the 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 we have a slight shortage here and a slight surplus there so we can imagine that the it'll work out that that the uh, about about four four hundred and fifty dollars an hour so then the what that means is is that the price comes down by eighty dollars an hour surgeons make a little less the cost of health care in Alaska goes down a little bit the number of people getting heart surgeries increases a little bit and then you can see whether you think that the AMA right um, is helping society or hurting society over uh, in this example. You know, and then you take a look at a lot of examples and you look at the aggregate and you evaluate it. But definitely this is a, a case against the AMA rules because it's driving prices up and making people less, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's a downside to it. Of course, every policy has downsides, but you should evaluate that. Okay. I think that um, you're getting a, a feel for things. I'm going to give you some more of these later. Let me uh, know what you think. And uh, if you like the button and subscribe, <laughs> we'd appreciate it. Thank you so much.